Hey, welcome inside the studio. Hey, I wanted to give you a little inside peek kind of into the studio and the materials that I use today. It's all about what materials I use and why. You're going to find a lot of them at uh, onesourcecoastairbrush.com. Good buddy of mine, Dave, uh, runs that, that shop over there. Tons of information. His whole staff will be so kind to walk you through anything that you want to know when it comes to airbrushing, art, creativity, um, and trying to take your talent, especially when it comes to airbrushing and how you're going to apply that in your own way. So let me start. I'm kind of going to give you a little bit of a history of where um, where I started with wet paint and why and et cetera, et cetera, as well as the airbrush themselves. When I first started airbrushing, I was doing portraits on canvas uh, and also t-shirts. So there was a textile industry and then there's also um, a canvas fine art industry. It used to be illustration board as well. For me, I you know started with paints that were already thinned down stuff that was really user friendly. If you're just a beginning airbrush artist, you gotta go right here with uh, Calm Art by Medea. Uh, it's a water-based ink slash uh, paint. Uh, fantastic to use, really easy to run through your gun. Uh, you can still use a brush with it. And you're gonna notice that the colors are really, really nice. Um, I have specifics that I absolutely love. It's an absolute staple in my, in my, um, in my arsenal of paints. And that is, I'll use the raw umber, I'll use my uh, transparent smoke, transparent black, and their opaque white. Absolute must that I use in everything. Uh, I really, really love those those uh, those staples. And um, I don't know. There's just uh, their their black is a really nice brown black. It's not a blue ba uh, blue black, so it's really warm. And especially if you're doing like old black and white photographs, you're kind of going to do like a vintage style look. It's fantastic. Um, from there, I will also, so you got to remember, I'm mixing, when it comes to the ones I'm explaining to you right now, I mix these together. So if I'm using Aeroflash, which is a great company as well, these, these uh, the pigmentation and the potency of how bright these colors are, are incredible. I will take this and sometimes diffuse it down with a little bit of Calm Art and Media. So I will actually use and mix these mediums together. So I'll use... Um, Oh, you, I mean, they just have a fantastic array of colors. You can get all these at Coast Airbrush. And you can also use these to air, uh, you can also use a, a brush with these as well to go in and do detail work. My favorite color, probably one of the most used colors that I'll use when I use um, the Aero Flash colors, uh, this is by a company called Holbein. I will use the sepia color. It's fantastic. It's a, an amazing, amazing uh, vintage style color. Uh, really warm. I'll put a little bit of the transparent Calm Art Black in with this, and that's what I'll use for a lot of my black and white portraits. Typically, the number one, and I'll just give you a couple tips as they're coming to mind here as I'm going, is whenever you're doing black and white photography, uh, one of the biggest mistakes is actually starting out with a white canvas and then just taking these colors and starting. That's one way to do it, for sure. But a lot of, a lot of times what happens is artists will come back in with straight white, try to do their highlights, and they're wondering why it looks a little weird. Typically, I will, lay a, I will lay a base of uh, a medium gray or a mid-tone gray that's warm using those colors, then, then get my image up on there and then do the actual painting. That'll keep it from being just a stark white that's an off color. So like when I go to do my highlights, it'll be white plus a little bit of the sepia or a little bit of the, the transparent black. It's not just a straight white. Even though it'll look like gray on your white paper towel or whatever you're using to test, you're going to find out that you're going to have uh, it's going to be more of a light, light, light gray color. But once you put it on your canvas, it's going to look perfect. It's going to look beautiful. So I'll step it up. Then you have your normal um, Liquitex acrylic paint in a tube. I typically will use a little bit thicker viscosities. They have them where they're already thinned down. But Liquitex is a fantastic uh, brand. There's a ton out there. But it's personal preference when it comes to um, how thick you want to buy the paint. Whether you're buying it in a tube, whether you're buying it already thinned down in a little tub, or whether you're buying it where it's actually in a thick jar and you're scooping it out with a palette knife and you're going to have that really thick, heavy body texture. Everybody has personal preferences according to what it is they're going to paint. So you can thin this down. I have watered this down and I put it through an airbrush. An airbrush can pretty much take anything that uh, uh, you'll put through it as long as it's thin enough. So if you're going to use uh, a water-based product, it's just thinning it down with water. If you're going to use a solvent-based product, you're thinning it down with the reducer or the, the solvent that uh, coincides with the product that you're using. I'm a, there's a newer product that's on the line. It's been around for a couple years, and that's Wicked Airbrush. Uh, these Wicked colors are from Createx. Createx was one of the fabric colors back in the day. 
Createx made a, a, a great line of paints that allowed you to be able to spray on t-shirts, leather, jackets, um, et cetera. And these would be great, um, wonderful, wonderful uh, paints to be able to utilize, and they're thick. So they would hold up really good in fabric. You could heat set them with, um, with an iron. But now they came out with this new line where you're actually using a little bit of reducer instead of water, and you're putting them in these colors. And the colors are wicked. That's the best way to describe it. They're, um, that's kind of like uh, paint on steroids when it comes to color. So really user-friendly, water-based, um, excellent color. You can use these on canvas. A lot of people use, some people have used them on automotive where you're doing helmets, you're doing um, illustration, you're doing, uh, I mean, uh, you can pretty much put it on anything. Uh, but when it comes to automotive, I will step over here to which is my favorite product and that's House of Color. Okay, this is a, a, a clear that I will use over small items that I'm doing. Let's say I just want to put a protective coat over something. This is a rattle can and it's a single stage, meaning it doesn't have um, the, the uh, pigment than the hardener. So if I'm doing a helmet, let's say, and I want to um, throw some color down on it and then clear it without having to take it to a major spray booth, I can just hit it with this rattle can. It's a quick little fix and allows it to be protected but still gives it some gloss. It's really, really nice. Uh, but House of Color is a, typically a, a two-stage program, and uh, the format of it's fantastic. You'll have base coats, and then you'll have candy base coats, and then you'll also have uh, what's called a, like a candy system where, uh, and Dave can go a lot more into this. They have education for it over at Coast Airbrush. But when it comes to automotive, you can um, base coat things with a solid color, then you can come back in and literally mix to your liking a clear paint with the reducer and adding drops of what's called candy concentrate, which makes it very, very, um, lots of depth and you can keep layering it up like a lollipop and it has that really beautiful luster. You're gonna see that look a lot when it comes to, you know, stuff on uh, motorcycle tanks, uh, helmets, um, boats, a lot of stuff that's automotive. Okay, so you saw how I was talking about um, Comart, uh, from Medea, got Aero Flash from Holbein, Liquitex, you've got uh, Wicked Colors from Createx, fantastic, and then you got House of Color. This is my staple. So when you come into my studio, this is literally um, the products that I've got um, in my arsenal. Now, in terms of taking these and putting them on different things, there are, have artists taken uh, urethanes and actually put them on a canvas? Yes, they have. Do I advise it? Not really, because it's there's no reason for it, and um, you know, it's, uh, when you're dealing with urethanes, it's going to, it smells, um, and pr for me, I just like the ease and the use of acrylics. They dry really quick. They're really, really nice, but again, it's personal preference. Art is art. Make whatever the heck you want, however you want to make it. Um, now, getting those products onto, uh, getting those products onto the surface, I use, um, I love Windsor & Newton just for my brushes and detail brushes, they have a really great super small line where you can get in there and just um, double zeros, ones, where you can get down there and get some really, really nice uh, finite detail, especially like the uh, whiskers, hair, uh, really tiny uh, details when I do the water drops and the highlighting, uh, fantastic. Uh, the two brushes that I'll use, and one of them isn't here, uh, which is actually three, so I'll use the Awada Eclipse, and then I'll use the Custom Micron um, C, and then I will use the, um, gosh, I can't even remember the name of it. Back in the day, it was the RG3. But it's a mid-sized gun, meaning for base coating, or if I'm going to be doing, uh, like you'll see me do the vinyl mations, or if I was going to base coat this bottle, I wouldn't be using a small little airbrush to do it. I'm going to use a bigger mid-sized gun like this to be able to do the base coat much quicker, and it's going to be more efficient, and it's going to look better. Um, so it's kind of common sense. I'm not going to you know, paint a whole entire wall with a brush. I'm going to actually use a roller or I'm going to use an airless air gun. So uh, whenever doing uh, detail, I think people get, uh, they think when I get into airbrushing, I'm going to use, they say to themselves, I want to go and get the best of the best of the best. Um, whereas, yes, this is like a Ferrari, and this is one of the best um, airbrushes that is made. I believe it probably is the best uh, in terms of what Iwata um, promotes and manufactures. But uh, an Iwata Eclipse is hands down for me the workhorse. Uh, if anybody could say, hey, what kind of airbrushes do you want to have lined up on, on, in your studio, I would say I want the Eclipse. That is going to be the workhorse. Uh, it's easy to clean. Uh, the tip size and diameter is great. Uh, and no, you do not uh, change the tips in here uh, to get smaller detail. And everybody has that um, 
Uh, it's a paradigm shift, actually, where you have to realize you are the one that's controlling the amount of paint that's coming out. Uh, it has nothing to do with the air. I will be going into more tips and actually showing you some demos as to what works and how to make this thing actually run super easy where you are the one doing the creating and the brushes just along for the ride. A lot of people think that they have to interchange the tips and they have to change the diameters in order to get the detail that they want. Uh, that's a big myth. So um, there's going to be a lot of demos and little shortcuts that I'm going to be able to show you how airbrushing can be a lot of fun and very, very easy. But first, the foundations of why and what um, I use. And here's one rule of thumb, and Dave and I use this a lot over at Coast. People always ask, well, how do I know that I'm using the right, you know, the right paint and, the, or I should say, the right thickness of the paint, or when is it thin the best, how much air pressure? It works simple as, as, as a straw technique. If I'm going to run a really, really thick amount of product, like a shake or a, you know, if you're going to take mud and you're going to try and pull it through a straw, how do you get that through there? Well, you have to thin it down in order for it to run. So if you're going to have air that's helping with that, it's enough air and thin down enough to where you're not breaking the color, where it becomes water instead of actual um, paint or color. So these are a couple of things to keep in mind. How thin do you make these? If I'm going to take this tube, I'm going to thin it down just to where it's about, it, typically you're going to find it's about the consistency of milk, where it's still thin enough to be able to run through the gun, but at the same time, uh, you're not breaking the color. And you'll know when you've broken the color. Too much air pressure is going to be where it's literally flying so fast out of there you can't even control it. I don't look at a regulator. I, I literally do it by feel. Is there enough in, air in there to help pull, push this product out where it isn't lagging or spitting or looks kind of grainy? It's got to have enough flow to be able to um, come out of the brush. So I'll break, down, I'll break down a lot more of those techniques in the future uh, videos that you're going to see. But Today I wanted you to see the foundation of brushes, both hand brushes and air brushes, and which style of paint that I'm going to use for different applications, automotive versus acrylic, and um, also kind of a hybrid where you can use this for not only fine art, but also on automotive as well. I hope this has been a big, uh, a big help for you. Feel free to watch it again, and uh, good luck and have fun creating.